welcome. So we always, uh, I've always been introducing these webinars with uh, introducing the artwork that's behind me. So this artwork was produced by Debbie Simmons. And so she grabs uh, scientific data from organizations like CSIRO and other um, global organizations on the extinction rates of various species. And then she's mapping it across a timeline as well as on the actual globe. So in that case, it's from historical data, present data, and then future predictions. So we can watch the largest mass extinction of species as we learn WordPress in the background. And uh, I've got a pretty extensive run sheet today. I you load that up. Now this is really good for after this webinar. This webinar is gonna be very dense today. So you'll be able to um, then go and have a look at the resources and the plugins that I'm recommending. Um, if you wanted to just more sit back and watch this episode. Okay, so the intro. So most of this session is about next level WordPress. So last session I covered um, gen general plugins. So now I'm actually gonna be talking about plugins that I use um, from my experience, also my research, and then talking about some different case scenarios. So I'm going to start, uh, a lot of what I'll be teaching is basic because I'm trying to make these webinars accessible to people starting out in tech. However, towards the end of it, I'm going to then actually go to some quite advanced techniques. I'm going to deconstruct um, the Commons Library, which is a really advanced content management system and show you how that was built, the plugins that was used. Uh, because if you can master that collection of software, it really allows you to develop really powerful, customized WordPress websites. So the first thing uh, we should always start with plugins is, is what we should start with anything um, is do we have a brief? So a lot of people get excited by plugins and then they want to, you know, plug this in, plug that in, or their research says that they should, you know, must use plugins. Uh, it's really important to have a tech brief so you know exactly what you're trying to do. The less plugins you have in your website, the better. It means that it's easy to manage, there's less security risk, uh, less chance of conflict, it's just going to work better. However, you do want to use the amount of plugins that you need to do what you're trying to do. So yeah, obviously we're using WordPress because of the plugins, so don't be shy to use them, but you should always be justifying why you're using them. The other um, important thing to think about with your plugins is CPU usage. So we talked about in the, um, we're in the basic internet technology webinar about uh, hosting and it being actually just on computers, just like yours. And if you overload your computer, it slows down. And that's the same thing with your web server. So plugins like scanners uh, will seriously impact your um, CPU of your server and slow your website down. So for example, virus scanners, link scanners, broken link scanners, um, these sort of things will slow your website substantially. Also things like backup tools will uh, substantially so slow down your website. And we'll be focusing more on backups in the next um, webinar. And in that context, if you're using something that you think is a scanner or is high CP usage, then look at some external services. So for example, a link checker, you can get a plugin for it, but then there's also websites where you can just type in your web address and it'll scan your website for broken links. In that case, the work's been done by their server, not yours. So there's, there's always a few ways of doing things. Um, I'm just gonna quickly run through what we're not gonna cover because I, this is one of many webinars. So I um, don't wanna repeat myself for people who are watching them all. Um, so we're not gonna cover anything that's about managing your WordPress tech. That is the next webinar. I'm gonna be talking about updates, backups, migration, security, optimization, caching, and making your website faster. Uh, also, I covered Yoast SEO plugin in uh, the Google and search marketing, and that's one of my favorite plugins. Um, so a recommended plugin, but you can, you can go to that uh, webinar to see me talk about that. Uh, the other thing I cover in the WordPress plugins and themes webinar, which I did la last session, is how to choose a plugin. So I've got a, a system that I've worked out over a few years of how I actually choose and shortlist plugins. Because today I'm gonna to be listing heaps of plugins, but they're for my use scenario or for my brief. So in your context, they may not be the appropriate plugin. 
uh, it's a good place to start if you've, you've never used WordPress before or if you're um, you know not sure. However, um, you should you should always be questioning what is the best for you. So in that case, I've got a whole system which I'll run through in that webinar on how to choose plugins and um, also how to manage plugins. Okay, so I'll jump into it. So the first thing I'm going to start with is Jetpack, and Jetpack is a plugin that's released by Automatic, the company that released WordPress. And so how it started was we talked um, in the WordPress fundamentals, the difference between WordPress.org and WordPress.com. So WordPress.com is hosted by, by the WordPress company and they manage all the security, but you don't have much control over it. The uh, WordPress.org is what you download and install and you have full control over, but full responsibility off. So in the older days of WordPress.com, it didn't have much functionality. So they built this group of tools that, that did average things like contact form and social media shares, that sort of thing, and called it Jetpack. Then what they did is then they made that as a plugin that you plug into a WordPress.org website that gave you the same functionality as a WordPress.com website. That makes sense. So it's just a bunch of um, functionality that WordPress has uh, is delivering in .com, so you can have it on .org. Uh, and the next step that WordPress then did is to do commercial services. So you know WordPress is free and open source, uh, but they're still you know, putting a lot of resources into developing it. So they've got a few commercialization um, products. And so Jetpack was allow allows WordPress then to give free plugins, but then also sell some services. And some of the main services are, are security and backups. And I'll talk about that in the next webinar. Um, they've also got performance features and then other various features. So I'm gonna talk about some of those features as we run through. Um, the disadvantage of a of Jetpack is that you need to actually have a wordpress.com account. So you would go to wordpress.com, create an account as if you were going to use their blog system or their, their website hosting. However, you don't need to have a website up there. You just need that account. Uh, and in that context, then you can connect with your Jetpack. So that's the, one of the main disadvantages of Jetpack. Um, and it's also important to just jump in there and to do and to start switching stuff off because um, it has, quite a lot of functionality. And um, and I'm just gonna just jump into, uh, give you a quick look at Jetpack. So this Jetpack's not working because it's it's actually running off my desktop, um, but it'll give you a bit of an idea of some of the things that's, that's in here. So monitoring, so you can see if your host is down, can help update plugins, security, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I actually don't really use um, Jetpack that often. Um, however, there are some key um, tools that are useful and um, there are a few backup security solutions. And I think Jetpack, um, specifically their Vault, which plugs into Jetpack is really a useful tool to look at. We'll go through that next, next session. But yeah, if you are, do install Jetpack, I recommend going in and switching all the stuff off that you're not using. Okay, so the, the other um, really um, important, uh, I think powerful uh, approach is um, page builders. And I've talked about this a fair bit in the WordPress fundamentals. And what a page builder is, is it allows somebody to drag and drop and build a web page without using any code. And to me, this is a huge paradigm shift. So maybe if you've used Wix or Squarespace or Weebly, some of these, um, uh, hosted applications which allow you to drag and drop, which is really good because um, you know code is, code is slow and restrictive and is something that you should need to learn. So we've got a huge step um, forward. So I'll be running a whole webinar on Divi, which is my favorite one um, that's coming up. There's also um, Elementor, which is a, um, a leader in um, page builders. And And here's a blog, um, and there's many blogs which will talk about all the different page builders. Um, there's Beaver Builder is really important. 
Uh, and there's, there's quite a few other ones there. Um, and this will give you a rundown to that. So um, yeah, this really has revolutionized um, WordPress in my opinion. Um, and I run nearly all my websites running um, some sort of page builder. Now I also will just mention, um, I'll mention WP Bakery. So WP Bakery is the most used page builder in WordPress. Now the reason it's the most used is because it's the oldest. This was one of the first generation page builders and in history it's been a great uh, tool because uh, it's, it's, it was one of the first. How, um, however, it is now old. Um, and so I, I would see this as now just being superseded. So it's still being heavily used and a lot of people uh, like it. Um, however, I think Divi and Elementor and Beaver Builder uh, next generation. So I would, if I was you, I'd skip um, WP Bakery as an option. Now, w, the people who make WP Bakery have also started another tool, which is similar called Visual Composer. So I haven't used that, so I can't comment on that. Um, yeah, so I re definitely recommend you looking into page builders to help um, build your websites. And again, I'll be running through TV specifically in a lot of detail in a specific webinar. Um, there's also the classic editor and blocks. So for people that um, aren't fam that familiar with WordPress, in a recent update, it came with a new editing system. So in the future, this will probably be a drag and drop, but it's a different type of system which uses a concept they call blocks um, for building pages. So I think it's clunky um, and really early days. So I'm, I'm looking at that with interest because hopefully in the future it will get better. Um, so that now comes with default with WordPress. So you can install a plugin called Classic Editor and just switch that on and that'll that will revert you back to the classic editor, which is the old, um, which is more of an old fashioned um, approach. Okay, so this is the classic editor here, which has the buttons at the top, stuff on the left. And then the block editor looks like this. Um, which is a quite a different layout. So um, I won't go into much detail. We went through a bit of that in the um, uh, WordPress basics. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to communicate that there is um, an actual tool that will allow you to, um, a plugin that will allow you to swap between the two editors. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about email forms. And email forms are a massive part of websites. Um, and they actually can be quite complex. So I've, I'm just gonna spend a bit of time on actual email forms. Um, um, so that's, you know, um, like a contact form, you would have seen them, add, add your name, address, email, hit send, and it sends an email to the people. Now, there's some reasons why I would use an email form over just putting your email address. And one of the really important um, approaches to that would be email spam. So people, some spammers will actually create software that scans the internet for email addresses. So if you put your email address on your website, you'll get picked up by those uh, spam bots and then you'll start receiving lots of spam. So me personally, if someone puts my email address on a website, I'd be very upset by that simply because I just don't like spam. Now, there are some case scenarios where a email address is more appropriate. So in that case, um, I'm recommending um, installing the email address encoder and there's a link to that on the run sheet. And what that does is it uses JavaScript to scramble your email address. And then when the page loads, it displays it um, as the proper address. And that stops the, the bots from scanning it. Um, so that's a real key bit of um, software if you wanna use an email address anywhere on your website, uh, on the front end, of course. Now, some benefits of email forms is I just think that they're far superior user experience. Um, rather than clicking and having to open up your email software, um, you can just write the thing there. You can also have, um, you know, a lots of things like asking them questions. Um, you may have some pre-populated areas. So for a web developer, I would ask for their website, for example. Um, or, and you can also have multiple people. So you might click a certain person um, and then email sends to them or you can send it to somebody else. Um, the other thing that you can do with email forms is that you can have um, multiple notifications. So that's the email that gets sent to somebody. So, or responders. So if you go to my device website and you connect on the contact form, 
I use Gravity Forms, uh, a WordPress plugin, which then sends an email automatically back to the person. It says, hello, thanks for contacting me. Um, here, the, the most people ask, you know, how much does the website cost? So I go, this is, um, you know, how much we charge. This is some rough costs. Here's how we work. Um, and I will speak to you um, soon. So that means that if it takes me a while to email them back, they've got instant gratification that I've responded to them, which gives them a very positive vibe about my uh, project management. And also it answers most people's questions. So that just gives a very positive experience. Uh, you can also set them to send things like receipts if you're um, running events and, and those sort of things. Um, you can also send them to different people. So you might send an email back to the person that's uh, written with lots of detail, hello, how are you going? Versus the one that gets sent to you just may have the basic details. The other key benefit is integrations. So that means you can do multiple things with it. So for example, my upskill coach form, um, if you book um, a, a training session with me, then I can integrate Stripe, which then does the, pay, uh, the credit card transactions. I've also integrated um, MailChimp. So then you automatically then get um, synced up to the mail list. So, and then it sends me an email and then it sends them an email which has the uh, basically a tax receipt and also information about the course. So that's all automated and just done as one easy form. So that's the benefits um, and they can be a lot more powerful. We have some issues with them though. So it's not all just smooth sailing with email forms. Um, I've actually, in my experience, come across a high fail rate and that's for a few reasons. Um, we have lots of different layers of, of technology and software and if one of them fails, then the form can fail. Um, so that means that it, it stops sending. So if this is your main sales um, contact form, that's hugely problematic. They can also fail now because of um, spam um, filters. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. So they must be tested. Now, if you're getting a heavy traffic contact form, so you get emailed every day, well, you'll know that it's not working because you won't get one for two days and you'll go check it. Um, but if you get one like mine, which not much email comes through, then you should be checking them regularly just to make sure that they work. Um, because yeah, unfortunately they do fail. Another issue with um, email forms is they can be hijacked by spammers. So that means they can, um, they can hijack your form and use it to send email to other people. Now the way we get around that is uh, we put in a capacha. Um, there's a link to it on the run sheet and you would have seen them, um, those, they're annoying. You know, you click on it and ask you, show me the stop signs, show me the crosswalks, how many cars, those annoying things. Yes, I know they're annoying. Um, however, it's the best thing that I've come across at the moment to stop automated hijacking. Uh, also, um, spammers can write scripts and if you're using a popular form, then they can just automatically send an email. So they'll come to your email form and, and a robot will fill it out and send you an email. I send you spam. So in that case, the capacitor stops them doing that. Um, so it's important to put a capacitor in. Uh, and the one thing we can't get around and that's human spam. And there's a sad um, thing that's happening is the sweatshop set up with humans and their job is to, to literally click on the capacitors. So all day they're looking at, you know, what's a crosswalk and what's a fire hydrant. Um, so you will get some spam still come through your form. However, that's actually a human that sent that, uh, even though it's total spam. Um, but that's limited because it's expensive for them to send that spam. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about some recommended features. Um, so I recommend that your email contact form software keeps those emails to the database. So that means that they save it within WordPress somewhere. So in Gravity Forms, it saves it under the Gravity Form section. So the email gets sent, but then they're also inside my WordPress. That's really important because if a form fails, then that data is still there. And I can, I can go, oh, that sucks, I didn't get the email, but then I can also go back and find them. Some email forms don't keep the email. So if it fails, then you've lost all your email. You need Capacitor support. I've just talked about that before. Um, some forms don't support it, some forms do. And for a Capacitor, you will need to um, sign up to Google, get an API key. It's free, uh, it's just a few steps. Um, 
if you need integrations, so depending if your website's really simple, you may not need integrations, but if you think integrations are useful, then grab one that will do that. So I mentioned Stripe and MailChimp as examples of integrations that I'm using. And the other thing that you, that's really useful to have is a visual builder. So this means that you can, and I'll, I'll jump into Gravity Forms and um, show you one of those. Um, this allows you to drag and drop the different fields, just makes it easy to build for non-technical people. And I will just share screen again, share screen. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna open up to this uh, brief. Um, now, 18 best WordPress contact form plugins. Now, there's lots of them. Um, look at them all. So in that context, um, some, are ex some cost money. The, the one that I use, Gravity Forms, is very expensive um, for one website. However, I've got a developer license, so that's, that is divided up between lots of um, different sites. So I recommend that you go through the process that I described um, in the last session about how to choose a plugin and go through the contact forms and to um, find the right contact form for you. Now, some of these are uh, cost money up front. Some of them um, are freemium. So that means you get some basic features and you pay for extras. Uh, and some of them are free and open source. So um, let me just jump into Gravity Forms. This may run a little slow because I'm... Um... Okay, so if I go to Forms here and go Add-ons, so this, this is just a example. So I'm going to run you through a, a contact form. This is Gravity. Your plugin will be different, but it should do the same things. Okay, so if this is the, this is the contact form on my website. So I'm brave editing a live website. Um, and I'm going to jump between because it, it's so slow. So here's all the add-ons that you can add with this specific tool. You know, um, all these different CRMs. Um, and if we scroll down, we've got Zapier, I'll talk about it a bit. Um, it also has a survey, it has a poll, Slack, that sort of stuff. So you can send an email and then send it straight to Slack, for example, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's the MailChimp one, et cetera. So here's my form. And so I can just grab on, on the right, just grab some, some things and then I can um, just edit those. I can make it required. I can, you know, change the various settings and things like that. Um, so this, this is the form that I'm running. There's the Capacha. I'll need to configure that in the settings. I'll leave. Okay, while that's doing that, I'll also settings confirmations. Okay, so this is the confirmation that's, um, that displays when someone fills out a form. So in this case, because I've got a dedicated contact form, then I'll just load in this text. So in this case, I've edited it and says, thanks for contacting us, we'll get in touch with you, um, as well as I'll send them an email. Now, sometimes if I'm doing a form like book a webinar or, or buy something, then I'll usually reload a page because it really gives the feeling that you've submitted it, um, even though technically, it doesn't make a difference, but from a user, if it reloads the page, then it um, really feels. And there's the entry of the um, email that's come through. So then I've got a copy of those. Um, yeah. And then I've also got notifications. And uh, so the user one switched off, so it's only me getting it, but then usually I'll send one to the user. And there's all the details where it's getting sent. Um, and then we've also got these short codes so we can put in like the name, for example. So if we're sending uh, any of the email fields, so if we're sending the email back to the user, we could go hello and their name that they put in. And if you've got certain fields like asking them certain questions, you can then populate that into the email. So uh, that's just a really quick tour. Um, but yeah, for someone who hasn't used um, that before, I thought that'd be useful. Um, process to go through. Um, okay, so now I'm just going to jump into some really advanced complex stuff, but I'm going to cover it because it's an issue that's been popping up quite a lot recently. So we've, we've had um, a, an upgrade in spam filtering at the server level recently. So that means your host, 
people who host a website, where, you host, where your website lives, has put really sophisticated software to stop spam. We all hate spam. Now, what that's doing, though, unfortunately, is actually blocking your email being sent from the email form sometimes. So there's a complex system where we can verify our sender email address. Now, you'll do this if you're running something like Action Network, Nation Builder, or MailChimp. Anything that's a mail uh, email form, you need to set this up because if you send an email, say from Nation Builder or from Action Network, then just say it's coming in to the recipient's email, their server is going to check to see whether you've got these, if it's verified. If it's verified, it's going to trust it a lot more and it's less likely to go into spam filters. So you need to set up DKIM and SFT, S, SFP. Now I'm not going to go through that this session because it's complex, um, confusing, um, but it, I'm just explaining that to you so that if you're having those issues or you want to um, improve your email delivery, that's where you'd start researching. The other thing that I've done is I've replaced my WordPress email system. So this WordPress has a system built in that sends email and it's not, it's not the best for various reasons. So we can actually then set up an external email sender like SendGrid. So SendGrid is a bulk email sender software. So for example, Action Network actually use SendGrid to send their email. So we use a plugin called WP Mail SMTP, which then replaces WordPress's email system with SendGrid. And we also then verify our email address with SendGrid. So then our email is getting sent not from WordPress, but from SendGrid with a verified email address. So therefore your email will get where they're going. So that's sort of for the advanced users, but um, I'm seeing a lot more of it recently. So um, I really want to include that. So you at least know where to look when you're having these issues. Mm. All right. So now the, the another really important thing with WordPress is that you can integrate lots of things with it. And that's one of the things I really like about WordPress. So it'll give you a basic um, website and then you can integrate lots of different things. So in the not-for-profit world, a lot of the things we're integrating is CRMs, client relationship managers or databases. And we, we're um, planning some exciting webinars around that soon. Um, but there's lots of uh, what we call software as a service. So websites that are hosted, uh, services are hosted on other websites. So for example, it might be a restaurant book, booking form or menus or Google Analytics or like various different um, systems that you may be using that you want your website to integrate with. So in that case, if it's a um, restaurant booking form and you're using say menu log or something like that, then you'd want to get your menu log um, menu to embed on your website. So I'm going to talk about that concept and that's a really important part of uh, WordPress. So there's a few ways that we do it and you won't have many choice. You won't have many choices depending on the app. Um, something like MailChimp, there's lots of choices and I'll use that as an example later. But if your specific application that you're using doesn't have any options, then you may not be able to embed it at all. Um, generally, um, they'll offer some way of doing it, um, whether that's best practice or not. So generally, um, the common way of doing it is that they'll give you a bit of script to load into your website. So I'll just show you an example of that. Okay, so uh, this is an actually an Action Network um, embed code. So in the Action Network tool, um, I've created a form, which is similar to a contact form, um, which is sign up for these webinars. So the actual form that you use to sign up to the webinar. And then it, there was an area that gave me this code. Um, and so you'll need to look into your tool, whatever you want to integrate and find the embed code. Um, so this is this one here. Um, the Action Network one is, very good practice on the way they implement it. So in this context, I've used a widget to install it. So uh, widgets, um, in the in earlier days of, of WordPress, widgets were actually the safest way to bring in code. Now the issue I'm about to demonstrate is sometimes the WordPress classic editor can strip and destroy your code. So um, in the top right here, we have visual and then text. Now text is the HTML or the code view. Um, so in that context, if you're pasting code in, you want to paste it in code view. So if we now go to visual, 
And now let's just check it in text. So that's actually kept it intact. Now, then we can publish that and we want to test it because a lot of the time the classic editor will actually um, affect your script and uh, actually break it for some reason. Um, now that looks a little broken now, now that I've saved it. Yeah, so what, see how it's done that? It's changed the code. And so now if I open up in this uh, browser, it should display that, so that's gonna be broken. Now the good news is that the new block editor, um, if you're using, yeah, so see how this has totally broken it? Um, it's unlikely to work. Um, because what the old editor is doing is it's cleaning up the code um, or removing, uh, changing things for security. So that is really uh, annoying. So in that context, if you're using the uh, default editor, you could put the code in via a widget, which helps, or you may need another plugin, which allows you to add in code script. Or um, you can just leave it on text mode, but that's not very um, usable for most people. Um, so yeah, the new block editor, one of the great things about the new block editor is it's actually got a code block that means that you can add code in and it won't break it. If you're using a page builder like Divi, Elementor, those sort of things, then they will also have a code block. So if you need to embed your, your script, then make sure you're using some sort of code block to make it work. And in this case, um, the classic editor is failing us. So we'll need some sort of plugin to um, do it this way. Um, I generally don't do it that way anymore. I either use a widget or I'm using Divi or Page Builder. So um, I don't have a plugin offhand what you'd use for that, but there are out there. Um, the other um, way that some external um, scripts work is they use a technology called iframing. Now what iframing does is it basically grabs another web page and sticks it on your web page. Now this can be bad practice for many reasons. Um, it's usually okay if it's just one little thing that's embedding, um, but you wouldn't embed something like a forum or something like that because you lose all your um, page, page URLs. Also Google doesn't like it um, and it's got other problems. Now WordPress also blocks iframes by default. Um, so if you're using the classic editor, it's likely that your editor will also break your iframes. So in which case there are multiple plugins which allow you to put iframes into the content. So you need an extra plugin to display your iframe. And you'll see an iframe because where it says script, it will actually say iframe here. You'll be able to see it in the actual code um, that is specific iframe. So that iframes will cause you problems as well. The new block editor is fine. And the, you know, Divi and Elementor and those sort of things are fine. So you'll find the new versions of stuff is a lot better. Uh, another place that they'll ask you to put stuff is the HTML head. So a uh, web page has two parts. One is the part you can see that, that translates by the browser, and then it has a section of code at the top that you don't see, which has various information like the page title, your fav icon, various scripts, that sort of stuff. Now some um, scripts such as Google Analytics wants to be in, in the actual HTML head section you can use a temp uh, plugin. So if you look for HTML head plugins, then they will allow you to embed some, they'll, they'll dynamically embed that code within the head section of your website. Um, so in Divi, I've gone theme options integration, and then see here it says add code to the head of your blog, and they'll do that there. So there'll be things like Google Analytics um, script will wanna, wanna be in there. So that's where you've got to do it. Otherwise you can install a plugin which will um, allow you to insert code into your HTML head. And the third way to do it is to actually edit the theme templates. Um, and so that's next level. You sort of need to learn um, templates and that side of things. So I'm gonna show you how to embed a YouTube video. Um, I'm gonna talk about the technology behind. So say we wanna put this, this plug in, uh, sorry, this um, YouTube onto into my page. So I just grab the address up here and then with my new page, I just stick it either in text or visual, it'll still work. And there you go. It magically brings in the, the, um, the YouTube video, but it also brings in all the embed code. So there's actually a whole pile of code around that. So the way that technology works is that it's programmed to read 
https semicolon forward slash forward slash youtube.com. If it sees that, it goes, hey, this is a YouTube video, and then it automatically adds all the code around it. So that's really useful because instead of having to deal with iframes and scripts like we discussed earlier, which is what we used to do in the old days, um, we just simply paste in that URL, um, which is heaps really good for WordPress. Now I'll just um, show you the OEmbed website, just to give you an idea. Um, so it has a nice description here, then it has heaps of boring stuff. Um, could do with the graphic designer. Now if I jump down here, here are the providers that if you just type in a link, it will automatically create the embed for you. So 23HQ, whatever that is, um, but there are heaps of them here. Um, Flickr, for example, um, SlideShare, um, YouTube, Vimeo. So there's Flickr. So in that context, you could go, if you're, if you're not sure how to embed some media, just try it. Just grab the URL and paste it. And if you're in any luck, it will have a, a embed installed and it will actually embed it for you. Um, so yeah, just give that a go. Um, Cause I embeds like quite a, a ambiguous technology now. Okay. So the other way to um, install external scripts is a specific plugin. So a lot of um, scripts now will have their own plugin. So if you're trying to install an, um, MailChimp, for example, there's a heap of MailChimp plugins that will specifically do that for you. Um, as I mentioned before, contact forms um, will allow you to integrate um, some things like MailChimp. That's assuming they've got that, that option. Um, and also um, integration plugin. So in that context, um, so for example, WooCommerce, so you can get a plugin that uh, a Mailchimp plugin that you can install into WooCommerce, so that when you're checking out, there's a tick box saying "Add me to the mail list." So in that context, it's a, you could either have a specific plugin or you could have a plugin that fits into another plugin that's part of the user journey. So in that context, if you have a certain tool that you want to integrate, do a bit of research and work out which way is best for you. So I've sort of gone through the different ways that you can approach it. Now, always remember you want to keep it as simple as possible. I always tend to go for just embedding a script rather than adding a plugin or um, anything like that. So usually I'll start with a script for something simple and then I'll tend to, um, if it's sort of could be related to my contact forms, I'll tend to then use a contact form um, integration, but sometimes you won't have a choice in that. Okay, so I'm now just going to jump to MailChimp and I assume most people know what MailChimp is. Um, so for people who don't know, that's a newsletter. Um, it's really good because it's free for 2,000, for under 2,000 subscribers. So um, it's a really e good, easy way to get people started with a, a mail list. Uh, it's also got a really good drag and drop builder and it's also been doing a lot more things recently. Um, it's got... Um, it's like now you can get a web page built. It's got um, various CRM capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. But um, so there's quite a lot of ways that you can install uh, MailChimp. There's a MailChimp block that's just built into WordPress. So if you just use, if you're using the block editor, there's actually just a MailChimp block. Um, uh, okay, so that's on WordPress.com. Um, there's form plugins, like I mentioned, like Gravity Forms, and most of them do it. They have their own um, embed script. So within MailChimp, in their form builder, there's there's just a bit of code that you can you can grab and pay out, uh, paste in. And um, then there's um, okay. So there's the blog, and then here's a list of plugins. Now this is just MailChimp. Best way to internet, blah blah blah. I mean, look at all the plugins. I mean, there's heaps of them. How many plugins do you need to install uh, MailChimp? Um, so I'm sure some of them do other extra things um, or whatever. Um, but yeah, so there's lots of ways to integrate MailChimp, for example. But other tools, you may not um, have so much luck. So for example, Nation Builder, which is a popular CRM for not-for-profits. Nation Builder doesn't want to be on other websites. So it actively prevents, stops that. So it doesn't have any um, script allow you to do that. 
Um, they use an API system, so you can get things to talk to it. However, it's, it requires coding and it's quite complex. Now there is a plugin um, for Gravity Forms, so therefore you'll need to buy a professional version of um, Gravity Forms, and then they should build a plugin, and you can get WordPress to talk to Nation Builder. However, it's limited in the way in the way it does it. Um, so yeah, using Nation Builder doesn't really play very well with WordPress. But if you're using it in a simple way, then yeah, you can get it to do it. Um, Action Network, which is another popular CRM for um, not for profits. They have a really good script, so you can just paste that in and it works really well. They also have a plugin for that, so that can actually download um, all of your Action Network forms and then creates a short code. So that's just a one line of code that you can just paste into anywhere. And short codes uh, are designed to use in the WordPress editor, so you, you won't have any problems with that. So in the example that I showed you earlier, where we had that script um, go messy, um, if you installed the Action Network plugin, instead of this script, it'll just simply give you a um, short code that will look like this. Um, the network, you know, and a number, and it'll look like that. And in that case, that was foolproof and that won't break the script like I showed you earlier. All right. Okay, so that's been a bit bit dry, apologies, but I really, um, I think integration of um, external services is really important part of WordPress. So I really wanted to go through that with you. So now I'm just gonna change gears for a bit and I'm just gonna run through some useful plugins. These are plugins that I use and um, plugins that are recommended. Um, so yeah, and I'm gonna jump through them. Okay, I'll just jump back to the share screen. Um, da, da. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, let me start. So duplicate page and I'm running off the run sheet so you can um, link to these plugins. So I'm just going to show you what that does. So if I've got all pages here and if I roll over, see how it's now got duplicate this just here. So that just allows you to duplicate a page. Sounds like a little thing. It should just be built in WordPress. I'm not sure why we have a plugin for it. It should, but it's not, and therefore we do. Publishing help. Okay, so publishing help. Um, actually, let me pull that up. This is a great plugin um, I use for when you've got a team working on your website. So if you've got, I mean, if I'm just working on a website or there's one or two of you, then it won't matter. But if you've got volunteers and things like that, this is a really good website. Because what it will do is I'll put a tab in the left um, navigation of WordPress in the back end, and then you can create um, how-to documents. Um, you can link to, generally I'll link to existing WordPress services like how to create a page and some of the stuff that I've been going through um, in these webinars. However, you may have like how to embed our action network code and how, what size images do we use and how to use various things. So things that are custom for your website or even just for, for your entire digital marketing, it gives you a, a really nice publishing guide. So I really recommend that. Um, Image galleries are really important for obviously your website. And there are a heap of plugins for image galleries. Now I really recommend that you keep your media as default. So what I mean by that is that WordPress has this section here where you've got media and you've got your media library. So if you've used WordPress, you'll know what the media library is. So I'd recommend that you use a plugin that uses the media library as your, um, to create image galleries. Uh, the reason I say that is because there are plugins that create a whole nother library for the plugin, for the display of media. So that means it locks you into that software and it also means managing your content just becomes more complex. So yeah, I really recommend that you use that. Um, use a, um, a plugin that will keep default. Now Jetpack, I spoke about that earlier. Jetpack Carousel, um, is one such plugin. So if you install the carousel option, it allows you just to use the default WordPress um, galleries, which will allow you to build uh, these sort of things. Um, there's various settings. And then when you click on it, it does this beautiful pop-up where it goes full screen, description at the bottom. We've got this nice arrow to go next. 
and that's a really nice experience. So um, Divi has this uh, same um, uh, functionality. So if I'm using Divi or Elementor, then I'll just use Divi or Elementor. If you're not using a page builder, then um, Jetpack Carousel is a good example. Um, I'm going to talk about image compressors. Now, these, this is software that uh, grab all the, all the JPEGs and all, all the media on your website and they shrink it down. Now, in, if you've done any of my image webinars, you'll know that I will profusely nag to say, prepare your images before publishing. That means you have your image editor, you um, crop, resize, save for web, then you upload them to WordPress. Now WordPress does have image editing capability uh, and you can use plugins to increase that. Now that is a very bad approach because it means that your data of your website is massive. It means your backups are massive. It means managing your backups massive. It means your hosting's more expensive. It's just painful. So if you're in a situation where, um, if you're, in a situation where you've got a client which has just been uploading big files. Um, so some people will like download their images from their phone, um, which takes high res photos these days, uploads them and the website's massive. So I'll use a tool like Short Pixel. There's another one called Smoosh, I think it's called. And what that does, um, so they have not-for-profit free credits. However, it's like 10 bucks for 10,000 images. So it's just quicker just to pay 10 bucks. It will download every photo of your website. It'll compress it, it'll resize it, and then it'll put it back. Um, so this is a really, really easy way to really shrink down the size of a website. Um, now this is automated, therefore the optimization isn't as good as it possibly could be. So I recommend that you customize and actually do that optimization yourself. Um, okay, so we've got a question. Um, is there a reason you're creating new posts rather than pages? No, posts and pages are technically the same as far as the editing capabilities. Um, if under 2000 to produce a newsletter, it is better to use MailChimp or Action Network. Okay, so um, Action Network is free. Um, I'm not sure what their number is cut off if you're not importing data. So if you're starting fresh with a, um, a new, um, newsletter system, Action Network or MailChimp, um, I'd probably jump into Action Network because um, it will allow you to expand into that CRM. Um, although they've both got good features. If you've already got existing data, so you've already got a mail list, just say you've already got 500 people, you'll need to sign up for a paid um, Action Network um, account, which is 15 US a month. Um, not hugely expensive, but it's more than free. Uh, where MailChimp will let you import whatever you want um, uh, up to 2000. Once, once it's at 2000, then it charges, it start, the prices go up quite steeply. Um, Action Network has moved to paying per um, email. And they've needed to do that because they're using a third party called SendGrid to send it. Um, I've been using Virtual Integration for SRD. It's free and valid for not-for-profits. Good to a point, not sure on integration. So I haven't used Vertical Integration, so um, I can't comment on that. Um, so Greg's just sent that to our panelists. So I'm going to send it to the attendees as well because that's uh, something that people could explore. Because yeah, there's so many options these days. So um, unless I've had experience with something, I'm not going to bag it out. Um, and there may be certain reasons why you're using a certain tool. Um, price is another. Okay, Broken Link Checker is a very popular plugin. And I run, a, I run a service where I provide free hosting for about 50 not-for-profit websites and Broken Link Checker is banned. And the reason it's banned is because it scans broken links all the time and it puts huge load on the server. Um, stupid use of server um, resources. So if you want to use that plugin, sure, you can use it. Switch it on, do a scan, switch it off. You don't want this thing scanning in the background. I would recommend though, if you want a link checker, is to actually uh, use an external service. So if you just search for a broken link checker or um, something like that, you'll come up with websites, which you just type in your address and it'll scan your website. That means their server's doing the work. Um, TablePress is a great plugin if you've got tabular data. So, you know, a table. Um, 
Now, don't build website layouts with tables. Now, this is a little clunky. Um, however, let's go to demo here somewhere. There you go. So allow you to do these sort of tables, but also do some great things in the fact that it will let you um, sort filter as well. So if you've got, yeah, tabular data on your website, this is a great tool. Um, the disadvantage is, it's a bit, is you've got to build each table individually. We'll give you a short code. Um, you can actually um, cut and paste HTML um, tables. And there is a new block, I believe, for tables, which I haven't used, but that may be um, better as well. Um, but yeah, if you've got like a real key document um, that's a tab tabular data, then um, that's a really good tool. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about 301 redirection. Um, so just say you change a URL. So my example was, and if I jump to my um, webinars here, I, um, I call this strategic communications. Um, and I had a different name for it. I can't remember what I called it originally. I had my marketing hat on and then I put my search optimization hat on and changed the name. So in that case, then what I need to do is change, we want to set a 301. So what that does is it automatically redirects from the old address to the new address. This is super important if you've got um, web pages on your, web, on your website which are already search optimized. So if people are linking to that page or if Google's linking to that page, what a 301 will tell Google is that here's the new address. So if you've got search rank, if, you're, if your page is ranking and you change the web address, you can actually transfer that whole rank to the new page, which is something you really want to do if it's an important page. So um, 301 to, for Google, but you also want to do it if anyone's linking to your website. Um, I made an error with one of my links on my newsletter um, and I did, did naughty and didn't test the link before I sent it, which you should always do. Um, so then I quickly created a redirect from the misspelled thing to the proper page so that when people clicked on the wrong link, it redirected. So this is a really important thing to be doing or to have on your website. So redirection, um, there's a few of them that do it. Um, now I'm just going to show you a quick thing when I installed it. Um, if I jump back to plugins, so I'm running this off my desktop, so it's a bit faster with uh, Zoom. And I'm just going to go to redirections. Okay, so it hides it under tools. So let's jump to redirection. Now it's asking here, when I um, re redirect, um, start setup. Okay, so it's asking me to monitor permanent changes. That's gonna scan my website regularly. Um, it's the same as a link checker. So I'm definitely not gonna switch that on. Um, remember, you don't want anything scanning your website automatically. Um, I'm not gonna keep a log. You may wanna keep a log if you're interested in it, but um, you're probably better off using Google Analytics for that. Continue setup. Um, finish setup. Uh, da, da, da. So just quickly show you an example. Um, actually, I might just jump to this website where I've got some set up. Um, where are we? Tools, redirection. Now, if you've got a, a whole website that you're redirecting, you can use what's called HT Access, which is if you've got access to your file to your file directory on your host. So if you know what that means, that's the best practice. If you don't know what that means, that's okay. Then do it this way because this is a simpler way of doing it. So you can simply see here, I called, um, I called the webinar plugins-themes. Doesn't really make sense, not good for search engines. So then what I did is I renamed it WordPress plugin themes, makes more sense. So therefore, if you type in plugins-themes, it will redirect. Um, visual content strategy, I, remove, I changed it to visual content, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so 301 is a really important thing to be doing on your websites. Okay, Google Analytics. Um, so we should all know what Google Analytics is. They give you data. Um, yes, the privacy issues around Google, Google sucks. Um, however, it is reasonably anonymous um, and your website is public. So um, I'll leave that up to you. So there's a few ways of putting in Google Analytics. Now I showed you earlier how to use Divi. 
Um, yeah, what do I think of Monster Insights? Um, I'm about to talk about that. Um, so there's a few ways of putting it in. One is just to paste the code like I showed you with Divi. Another way is actually to code it into your template. So if you've got the skills to be using your templates, uh, to code into your template, you can do it that way. Um, so these two plugins, um, there's two types of analytics plugins. One is super complex ones, and the other are super simple ones. So um, what these do, now the Google Analytics code is a, a similar size to the code that I showed you with the Action Network. It's only a small little bit of code, and that allows Google to track all your pages. So you only need a simple plugin to do that. Um, so this plugin will do it. Now, see how it uh, hasn't been updated for two years. Well, the Google code hasn't been updated for two years, so it's not a big deal. Um, here's another one that's been updated recently. This just sticks in the code, really simple. Okay, so now I'm gonna to jump to Monster Insights. You asked the question when I think about them. Um, so Monster Insights bought a really popular, simple Google Analytics plugin um, from Yoast. Uh, and then they um, expanded it. Now there's a few um, ones similar. Now what they'll do is they'll put, not only put in your Google Analytics um, code, but they'll do their own tracking as well. So they'll create more data um, on top of Google Analytics. Uh, and then they'll also display it in a dashboard. So that's super useful. So you can log into your WordPress and just see how much traffic you've got. This is really good for your team. Um, your WordPress editors that like, you know, they've just put in a really good blog post that's getting heaps of traffic. That's great for morale or they can test to see, you know, was that blog post good or not? Now, their privacy on all of these tools was god awful. Really, really awful. Um, I did just some quick research on some of the leading ones um, recently, only about a month ago, um, and all of them we're bringing all that data back to their server. They had dodgy privacy policies, those sort of things. So if privacy is something that you believe in or respect, then um, using these Google Analytic third-party tools um, is bad for that. So I'd, I'd avoid them if privacy is one of your issues. If you uh, think privacy is less of an issue, you will need to put this in the privacy policy that they, these companies um, are mass gathering data. So their business model is to provide really free tools and then uh, they sell the data, they control the data. So um, as well as Google doing its own dodgy thing, you've now got a third party that's probably being dodgier as a middle person grabbing that data in between. Um, that's, that's Monster Insights, but you know, they, they give you a great tool. Um, I re I'd recommend that you just use Google, if you're using Google Analytics, just to use Google Analytics and log into that window um, to do that. Okay, um, and I can jump to that. And you'll find also when you load it in, and I do actually have it on this website, um, it's quite spammy. Now this isn't working um, on this on this browser because I've got ad blockers. So it won't even work without an ad blocker. Um, because that's how much it's tracking and how, how um, you know, uh, they don't care about privacy in that context. Better search and replace. Now be careful with this tool. This is like you're gonna grab a chainsaw from the kitchen. You know, you wanna be sober when you use this tool. You uh, wanna think about what you're doing and um, yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm not sure where that went. Uh, okay, what this does is does a search and replace on your database. Doesn't sound like much, but if you um, uh, put in some sort of code um, and you search in place and the code's wrong formatted, you could break your, your database. You can cause all sorts of damage in here. So um, you just be careful. What I use it for usually is if I've migrated a website, so just say I've got it at dev.actionskills.co and then I'm moving it to client.com. Um, I will then do a search and replace on that URL to make sure that it's all migrated across. Um, you may have upgraded your security, so you, you're now using HTTPS instead of HTTP. I uh, went through that in the uh, tech basics. So then you can do a search and replace and force that S onto all the URLs. Um, just say you've spelt your brand name or someone's brand name a lot in your website, you could just do a search and replace and, and update that. So that's quite a useful tool. It's very powerful tools, so be careful. It does have a dry run feature so that you can just 
do a search replace and it just doesn't replace, it just counts how many things are on there and that sort of thing. So be careful with that tool, really good one. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you, I'm not gonna go through Yoast SEO um, because I go through that in the search marketing, but I'm going to um, just show you um, a, some interesting things. I'm gonna show you the, the um, social side of it. So the social media side of it. Um, now, I think it's really important to optimize your website for Facebook and for Twitter, for LinkedIn, because ideally you want people to share your pages and you want them to look good. So if you come to the social um, section in Facebook, you can put up here an image that would display if there is no image on any page. So just say you wanted to pay, you, uh, share your, your WordPress um, webinar page on Facebook and you didn't have an image, you could upload an image here that would then display for any of those scenarios, um, which is uh, are useful. Because how many times have you seen, uh, you tried to share someone's web page? You go, this is great, I'll share, share it with all my friends. And then when it loads, it just looks awful. And you go, yeah, I'm not gonna share this, this is awful. Um, or if you do share it, no one clicks on it because it looks awful. So you can also do the same um, with Twitter, and you can do the same with Pinterest. Um, okay, so if we just go to a normal page, add new. And um, we scroll down. So this is the uh, Yoast plugin bit here. And again, I won't go through the actual SEO bit. If we click social, we can actually optimize the title and what displays on that share. Now by default, um, WordPress will show the featured image. So this is the WordPress default featured image. So if you add one there, then that will display on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. So every page should have one. So I recommend setting your featured image. Now you may have a featured image that you want different to your Facebook for some reason. Maybe if it's a blog post, you've got a feature image that looks on your web, on, that works well on your website. You want a different one for your Facebook. You can upload an image here, and therefore it will um, display. So, for example, I will show you, um, and I'll log into my Facebook in a live environment. Let's take a deep breath. It's always risky. I'm going to share this this uh, URL here. And this is what loads. So I've, I've loaded in the best image that I can think, that I could think of. And I've managed, I've controlled, it says actionskills.co. And I've managed the um, title. So that's the best that I can do, right? Now, before I did this, before I had all these webinars, I had another image here. So if you wanna update, um, if you wanna update um, your, your page, so just say you've done edits, Basically, Facebook creates a copy of that post and it remembers it. It's called a cache, so it's Facebook's cache. So if you update the image or you do any um, anything um, of that optimization, it's not gonna come through on Facebook. So what you need to do is you need to go to the Facebook debugger and put in your URL and hit debug. This will load the information that it's sharing. There's my image, my description. So if I've updated that image, I'll need to hit scrape again. Great language by Facebook, scrape it and scrape that page. This will reload and clear its cache. Now, sometimes you might need to click that once or twice, but um, this will then reload your new image into Facebook. Um, so yeah, that way you can really optimize your links. So anything that's an important page, you should optimize for Facebook. Now, the good news is, is that the language that this uses um, which is the open graph tags are the same that are used by LinkedIn, Twitter, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that means if you get it working well for Facebook, generally it will look nice on um, LinkedIn and that sort of thing. There's a plugin called BuddyPress. Now, um, I can't show you an example live because the recent one that I set up is a members only sort of site. But generally, um, if you wanted to do an online forum, now BB Press 
is also software that's developed by WordPress. So the benefits of this is it's part, it, it uses best practice and um, you know, all the WordPress approaches to things. There are other options though. So if you've got certain features that you need for your forum, then um, this there may be a better tool. So, uh, but what BuddyPress does is it, it does a really um, strong user profile around that. So in the case of the scenario when we used the, the um, forum, we wanted to have, you know, really good um, descriptions on the people. It also has like a, a bit like Facebook where it'll have their activity, the list down, um, it allows you to put people into groups and to do that sort of thing. So. Um, BuddyPress and BB Edit, uh, sorry, BB um, Forum together make quite a powerful forum tool. Um, now, BuddyPress is also one of these plugins that has heaps of plugins and lots of functionality. Um, I do find that getting support and documentation on BuddyPress is really um, slim. So when, uh, so if you're happy with the way it works outside of the box, then that's fine. But if you want to customize it, I mean, it has a full um, system to do that. Um, however, I do find documentation and support pretty limited on that. Um, but yeah, definitely a great tool to look at. And I have built a few websites in that. So it can do some nice things. And I just want to talk a little bit um, about uh, members only websites. And I find that the my experience with the members only plugins have been pretty crap. Um, I've just found them not user friendly or easy to set up. Um, so maybe some new versions of the plugins will come, come out that are better. Um, now, if you want a members only plugin, it's definitely essential that you set up a brief of what you're trying to do, what access do people have and all of those things so they can really make sure you get the best plugin for you. Uh, and there are quite a few different members only plugins. Um, some of them um, have commerce built in. Some of them will plug into WooCommerce, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you just want to lock off your whole website. So um, one example, the last BuddyPress website we did, we moved that to a different domain and then we just locked off the whole domain. And there's some really uh, easy to use plugins that will just lock off your whole domain. Um, it just gets more complicated if you want to have a, a paid site, um, paid content, all that sort of stuff. So uh, I'll let you do that research. All right. So if you've um, heard about, if you're into WordPress commerce, you would have heard of WooCommerce. So WooCommerce um, was a plugin and um, it was op because it's open source, that means that someone else can grab the code and fork it and call it the, their own. So there was real controversy a few years back because someone grabbed the commerce software and just um, forked it and then it became theirs and then they started developing it. Um, although legally you can do it, it's also um, you know, not very ethical and bad taste. And anyway, so WordPress came in and bought, bought that out. And so now uh, WordPress own it and control WooCommerce, which is good news because then it uses all the best practice WordPress um uh, approaches and you know it's going to be managed by wordpress so you know it's the best they can do so that's the intro to um woocommerce um now if you're going to be building a shop or any sort of commerce on um wordpress then i'd recommend that you um use woocommerce there are, are other options but woocommerce is the main one it's run by wordpress so again, you'd need a brief about what you're trying to do with the commerce system. So if you just want a simple transaction, then maybe a contact form works best. So for example, when I was running um, my commercial training, so this exact training I'm doing now, um, before I was giving away for free, you could, I just set it up Stripe with a form. So you just put in your contact details, put in your credit card and it just booked a ticket. Now the benefit of using something like WooCommerce, well many benefits, but one of the is gives you a shopping cart. So if you've got multiple things, so you might say, okay, so you might want to book for an event and then you might um, book for this training, but then there might be another training session you book for, then you might want to buy some training resources and then make a donation, that sort of thing. If you're using WooCommerce, you need to be strict with security. Um, there's a, obviously a lot more incentive for a hacker to get into your website. So make sure that you're very strict with your security. 
Um, I'm not going to go step by step through uh, WooCommerce. It is very intuitive. So, uh, and it's well documented. So you'll be able to install that and set it up for yourself. I'm just going through some basics for you to think about um, in this context. Um, okay, so one of the really important things about uh, WooCommerce is it transacts money. And we use a payment transactor to do that. Now I recommend Stripe, stripe.com. Um, so basically you need an Australian bank account uh, and legally be able to trade. Then you set up a Stripe account and validate that. That means that then you can accept credit card payments on your website. Now it, Stripe is similar to PayPal and I find that it's a modern version of PayPal. Um, there's also a company called Braintree, which is similar to Stripe and that got bought out by PayPal. So these are, these are companies that just allow you to run credit cards. Now the important thing is, is that they're doing the credit card transactions on their site. So they embed the code onto your site, someone puts a credit card in and then it goes to their site, transacts it. This is really important because you don't want to be touching credit card transactions. Um, many, there's a lot of laws around it, a lot of security issues, that sort of stuff. You don't want people's credit card details. You just want to know that it's been paid and you want to know who did it and you know the product and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, you can use PayPal. Now WooCommerce has a large amount of plugins for transactors. So if you want to use some obscure one like Braintree and I had a client that demand that, so it will work. I recommend Stripe is the best one out there. When you're choosing transactors, you need to look at um, how much they cost per transaction, that sort of thing. So WooCommerce um, is a e-commerce platform, but it is designed to have lots of plugins. So if you think of WordPress, it is like WordPress in the fact that it has um, plugins. Um, they call it extensions. So I just want to show you some examples of some um, WooCommerce plugins um, or extensions. So the Australian post shipping method, so what this does is that Australia Post has a shipping API. So that means it's got how much a parcel weighs or how big it is and how much it will cost to send it from this postcode to that postcode. So this plugin connects to that. So you can actually do live shipping calculations with Australia Post on your website. So if, if some shops it's easy to do flat shipping um, or free shipping. Um, however, if you've got, you know, complex products as far as weight and you want the, the user to pay for shipping this plugin work. So the way WooCommerce works is WooCommerce is free and then the plugins cost money. Some plugins are free. So in this case, this is, this is $80 a year, $79 a year. So yeah, that, that's just that up. Name your price is custom one that we use for donations. So this is useful in the context that um, say you're running a shop, you're selling t-shirts for your campaign. And then you might want to go on the checkout, you go, oh, would you like to donate? So you could create a new product called donation, and then they can type in how much they'd like to donate on top of the t-shirt price. So this is a useful uh, plugin. Um, we, we call them subscriptions. So what this does is it allows recurring payments. So you could set up a donation system, for example, um, or maybe a, um, so if I created a um, technical training club, um, and then I charge for access. I could then set up a WooCommerce subscriptions and then charge someone, you know, for monthly access. Um, for example, your membership plugins. Um, so if you've got a members only site, they will likely use Word, Word, WooCommerce um, as part of their software and then use WooCommerce subscriptions. So you've got these layers of software that will do different things. And then they'll allow you to do that subscriptions. Now Stripe out of the box does do um, subscriptions. So again, if I wanted to set up that club, i will just use Gravity Forms, which supports Stripe, which then supports um, reoccurring payments. And I'll do it that way because it's much simpler. Again, depends on your brief and what sort of tools that you, you want to do with that. Um, so yeah, that's a segue in the idea that WooCommerce actually uh, functions as a plugin for other plugins. So other, so for example, a lot of the booking ticket booking software, they actually use WooCommerce as their um, engine, which connects the transactors with their ticket booking system. Um, so it's used um, quite extensively for that. So if you're doing anything with commerce, generally you'll see WooCommerce somewhere there.
And the benefit of WeCommerce is that it's just, there's so many different things you can plug into it. So that allows you to, if you're running some sort of system and you want to add something abstract or you want to do something, then you can do that. Um, it's the best tool to do that. Uh, it's really important before doing any of this is to have a brief and think about the user journey. So I had a client that was booking um, um, appointments um, as a consultant, and then they had a literally a WooCommerce thing set up as their products. And it just didn't make sense. Like the user would come, um, I want to book an appointment. What's with the products? Why am I adding these to a cart? It just really didn't make sense for a user point of view. So uh, make sure that you've got a brief for what you want your, um, commerce to do and then you want to make sure that you've got a nice user journey coming through now in saying that though um, for most not-for-profits you'll be looking at a sort of donation system is the main reason you'd use WooCommerce in which case um, Action Network supports donations via Stripe that makes more sense because it's going straight into your database um, and those embed the um, donation forms embed really well into face into WordPress it's just bit slow to, to load. Um, if you're running a Pacific crowdfunder, then Raisley is a really good tool. Um, so you could then just jump to another website, which does a really good fundraising context. You can then export your data. So there are some different tools to do um, donations. And I probably wouldn't recommend using WooCommerce for donations on a not-for-profit site, that there are better ways of doing it. But WooCommerce could be interesting if you're, say, selling t-shirts or merchandise. Or, you know, there's some other case scenario that makes sense for you to be using it. You may, um, on your site, already have e-commerce installed. Maybe you're using it for your ticket booking system, in which case you could then consider using it because you've already got it there. Depends what you're trying to do. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump to um, some more advanced approach. I'm going to talk about libraries and advanced content management WordPress is a content management system. It manages content. And um, so I'm going to now jump and deconstruct actually the commons library, which we built, which I built with the librarians. I'm gonna talk about the tech that runs this and all the plugins and all that sort of stuff. And what that will do is it will, it will allow you um, to, if you, um, follow this, it allows you to build very complex and advanced um, systems. So I'm gonna go through some of the WordPress technology that underpins it, and I'm gonna go through some of the plugins that underpin it. I'm gonna talk also about what is easy for a non-developer to do, and then also explain um, where, you know, you need to learn a little bit more. Um, that little bit more that, you, that is helpful to learn in this context is WordPress templating which is here. I'm also gonna go through another example, Marigold Health Foods, where I've set up some of these, a simpler version of these technologies, and I'll do the complex one first, and then I'll jump back to the simpler one. So um, if you wanna go next level WordPress, then you'll need to learn the template system. Um, you'll need to learn the template files, the um, template hierarchies, and also template um, codes. So, um, I'm not gonna go through that. Um, maybe I'll do another webinar that goes through this, um, but I'm just wanting to introduce you to this if you wanted to go to the next next level. Now, most of this, what I'm gonna go through won't need this, some bits will. So I just wanna show you that. In saying that though, if even if you don't wanna go that way, there's, you'll still learn a lot from this next section that I'm gonna go through. So the first technology I'm gonna talk about is custom post types. So first I want to talk about post types, just what a post type is. Um, and this is WordPress jargon. Now the default post types are posts and pages. Now you see they're a little bit different and we went through this in the WordPress fundamentals. Now what we can do is we can create a custom one of us of this. So we can create a new type of post and call it what we want. So for example, if you install the Jetpack, you can turn on testimonials you can turn on portfolio. So you have pages, you have posts, you have testimonials. And it works exactly the same way as a post or a page will do. Add new testimonial. So for example, when you install WooCommerce, it will do the same thing. It will create a custom post type for product, if that makes sense. 
And so I've got a, another guide here. Um, and so that's why I've got the run sheet here. So you can come back in your own time if, if this is a bit complex. And then, um, so I'll give you an overview and then you can go back into some detail. So um, this gives you a good explanation of what, what they are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so to add a custom post type, there's two ways of doing it. One is to actually, the best practice is to add the code into your template. So I'm not gonna cover that. That's a bit more um, complex. So I'm gonna show you how to use a plugin to create a custom post type. And this plugin is great in the fact that you can then also, um, you can also then add that code to the template later. So I've come to install a plugin called custom post types UI. I'm gonna add a new post type. And here I'm going to go testimonials. I'm going to testimonials. And I'm going to say two because I've already created it earlier. And then I'm going to do a. This is a plural label. This is a single label. Now there's heaps of options down here. You can go through them in your own time. You can also turn off things in the editor. So for example, we can turn off, um, so all these things are turned off. So you might want to turn revisions back on. You may want to turn off the featured image, for example. Um, so I'm going to then add that post type. And then if we come to here, now we've got testimonials in the navigation on the side here. So then we go add new. And then it's just like a normal post. And so I'm going to go, um, Jane said something nice about me. Uh, great work. And then I'm going to publish that. And there's my, there's my page. So this at the moment now it will behave exactly like a WordPress page. If you look at my URL here, so I'm using a abstract URL cause I'm running it on my desktop, but that would normally say www.mywebsite.com. Now I've got testimonials here as the subtitle. So for example, if I jump to, to back to my action skills website, if I can go back to a web page, I find it here somewhere. Okay, so if I go to any webinar here, I've actually created a post custom post type for webinar. And if you have a look at the URL here, actionskills.co forward slash webinars forward slash the one I'm calling it. So if we look at my, um, in my back end, we've got here webinar, add new webinar. So it sounds sort of complex, but it can be done quite simply. Um, okay, so that's how to create a custom post type, which is actually quite easy and um, normal people can do it. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about custom taxonomies. So I'm just gonna introduce the word taxonomy, apologies for the jargon. Uh, what taxonomy means is it's the science of categorization. Uh, the reason I'm using that word is because uh, WordPress comes with two default taxonomies. That's categories and tags. So in that context, we can also create custom taxonomies that, um, that can be linked to different custom post types. So a commerce example could be, we could create a way of categorizing, uh, use the word color. So we could have products and then we can categorize them by color or sizes. So that means if a user clicks on a red, it will display all the red products. So the example um, here is that I've got topics as a um, taxonomy and then I've called it strategy. So in that context, if I go um, webinar, add new webinar, see how it's got topics. So I can go add new. All right, so I'm gonna go add taxonomy and I'm gonna call it okay topic for that example. All right, let's go color. We can spell it Australian as well. Uh, colors. And color. Okay, so here we need to attach it to a post type. So in this case, I'm gonna add it to my testimonial. So we can have red testimonials or blue. It doesn't really make sense, but um, now there's one setting that I want you to look at if you're using this tool. Now we wanna come down all the way down to here and I want, see it says hierarchical. Sorry, here's some more jargon. I want you to say true. 
So if you make a hierarchical, it will list all your um, terms here. If you make it non-hierarchical, then it will display like tags do in WordPress, which you need to type them in. So even for the anarchists out there, I still recommend that you use hierarchical taxonomies. Sorry for the jargon. Because um, what they'll allow you to do is just list them there. So it's just easy for the user to come in and tick them. If I turn that to non-hierarchical, then it won't display the list. Um, and that's as simple as that. So if you want to then edit the taxonomies, so you forget to make a hierarchical, you just click here and hit edit. And if I want to edit that post type, I just come here and edit the post type. So although it's full of jargon and uses big words, um, custom post types and taxonomies is actually really easy to implement using this plugin. Okay, so I'm now going to, so back to the commons library. We are using for the, um, the actual um, individual posts, we're using posts, uh, default posts. So this is a library item, but it's, and the reason we're using posts is if you, you if we um, have a custom post type, it actually puts that type in the URL. So in my example webinar, this URL would be forward slash webinar, which now, because we want the library not to have library item, we are using just a basic post system. There's also benefits for using the post because just a lot of themes and plugins are there to support posts, not custom post types. So wherever possible. So this website doesn't want a blog. Um, now, if they did want a blog, then I'd set up a custom post type and I'd call it blog or call it news. That way, and then the URL would be forward slash news, forward slash um, blog post, whatever. Um, so yeah, you want to think about the URL. So in this case, we're not using any custom um, your, um, custom post type, but we're using custom taxonomies. And specifically here, if we go into post, oh, there you go, news. So I did create actually a blog and I created that as the custom post type. So if we go to post add new, we've created a custom taxonomy for tag, roles, topics, format, collection, by, and activities. Now by is interesting because this is where we want to use author. Now WordPress uses author as a taxonomy, so therefore we're not allowed, we're, we're banned from using it. So we, we use by, it's a bit of a way to get around. So here's a, a live example of us using, um, using um, custom taxonomies. Now when this, when we were developing this library, we actually had some librarians um, they were really good at categorizing data and they wrote up a plan and then I looked at the plan and I translated that into WordPress language and then there was things I was saying well if you change that it makes it easier da 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 so they wanted to use these two the, the words tags roles topics um, and so then I just used custom taxonomies to be able to facilitate that for them um, and as you can see uh, that was actually quite easy for me to do Okay, so if I jump to the Commons um, homepage and I'll tap here and go green. Now you can see, and this is slow again, we're on um, the Zoom, but see how it's done this um, live search? So that's using the plugin Search WP Live Ajax Search. Uh, this plugin is designed for another search plugin, but it works with anything. So um, we use that. The default Word, Word, WordPress search engine is pretty crappy. So in that case, um, we recommend um, if you search is important to you, then you use relevancy. Um, it takes a lot of settings. Um, I won't go through that, but um, you can really refine what you're searching for. Uh, I'm gonna pick up the pace a bit because I'm just aware of the time. I've got a little bit to go through, so apologies. And if you need me to slow down, please um, hit me on the chat. Okay, so search filtering I think is really important. So if we hit uh, green and we go search, what this does now is this is displaying all the posts, I'll use the jargon here, all the posts um, that are related to the green. We have 45 results. Now on the left here, we are feeding in our taxonomies, format, topic, author, collection. Now we're not feeding in all of our taxonomies, just the ones that the librarians wanted to, to bring in. So here's a really interesting thing. 
we've also got the numbers here. So we've got, there's five that are tips. Um, so I can actually click on, I just want a case study. So I click on a case study and this will then now filter that down. So now I've got seven results. Now I might want a case study and I only want a case study by Nick. I click that and now I've filtered it down to one. So that technology is really, really useful for if you're um, filtering um, complex databases such as the library here. And that was done using a tool called WP for Fawcett, Fawcett WP. Um, this is a paid plugin. Um, however, it's very powerful and it's definitely worth the money for this example. Um, we've used it in a very simple way. Um, Fawcett WP does much more advanced um, filtering. I won't go through that now. Um, but that's the tool that we use to do that and um, really useful. All right, so now I'm going to jump to custom fields. Now custom fields um, is what that does is that it will, if I just edit this, edit this post, it um, gives you extra fields. So let me just load that, I'll show you. So here you've got the page title that you're used to and we've got the, the description. But if we scroll down here past our Yoast, um, here we go. We've got some custom fields. We've got the author, we've got the source, organization, location, release date, all these, these details, right, which are really useful. So what we do that with is a software called Advanced Custom Fields. Um, and pretty much every developer I know uses this tool. It's by a guy called Justin Tadlock. He's a Melbourne um, person. So if you go to the local WordPress meetups, you may meet him. Um, he's quite famous in the plugin developer. Most of this is free. Um, and it just, this is a really powerful tool to make websites. Um, so what we've got here is if we look on the front end and we scroll down to here, you'll see the detail that we've got. There we go, author, location, release date, um, the licensing. And uh, on the back end, um, we've got those details there. So we've got a program that if, if we don't put something in there, it won't display. So as you can see, if we mix custom post types, custom taxonomies with custom fields, we can build anything. Um, these are the three key technologies of taking WordPress to the next level. Um, and up to this point, you haven't actually had to do any coding. Um, except for now. So to get the, this on the front end, so we've got the back end, then this is really easy. So I'm just gonna jump to not the live website. We shouldn't be working with live websites. I'm gonna show you how to make those field groups. Um, so let's just go library and then we add a field and we're gonna call it um, location. Um, that'll make that. And then there's heaps of ones to choose from. Um, so text is a simple one. So for a phone number, you could put in the phone number. Um, I'm not going to go through the advanced ones because um, I just wanted to introduce you to the concept um, and you can do your research in your own time. But we can add a um, WYSIWYG editor. Now OEmbed, I went through earlier. So on my webinars, um, I can actually show you one of them. Okay, here we scroll down here. I'm using the same technology. So here's the video. So I can just put in the YouTube URL and then it'll display. If I click done, I've got it coded to just take out the details of the webinar. Um, and then I've got the time and date. So that means I can automate that, um, which is really useful. So if I just jump back to here, yeah. Um, and there's various options. Now you can also say where are we gonna display these fields? So in this case, post type, you now know what a post type is. Um, and I'm gonna put it on the testimonials. So, on, on another website, I've actually got a testimonials thing using advanced custom fields and I've got their LinkedIn profile. So I can paste in the LinkedIn profile. We'll make a link and jump to their LinkedIn profile. So that's a basic version of basic in, introduction to advanced custom fields. Um, super powerful technology. Definitely will take WordPress next level. Now the problem you have now is that you've, it's easy to get those fields on the back end. You now need to get that code on the front end. Um, which is, if I can jump to, okay, so you need to get the code here. This is the front end. There's a few ways of doing it. Um, the way that we, that I do it is I use templating. So this is the WordPress templating that I introduced earlier. So this is going the next level of your skills. 
Um, so if you're wanting to do anything advanced with advanced custom fields, you'll need to use, um, uh, you'll need to learn WordPress templating. Now, if you want to um, do more simple ones, like the text field and a few of those like date and the simpler ones, then there's um, short codes for those. So advanced custom fields has short codes, so you can just paste them into a WordPress editor. So that means you don't need to do any templating, but you can only use the simple options in um, advanced custom fields. Elementor, a page builder. Um, I haven't used it, but I've just done some research saying that this has support for advanced custom fields. So that's really exciting. It's a drag and drop page builder. So when you're um, building your pages, you can then just add in your advanced custom fields. Um, and then another way of doing it, if you don't want to um, use the code, is a plugin here called Insert PHP Code Snippet. So what that does is it allows you to um, put in the advanced custom fields PHP code. And the code isn't actually that um, complex. I'll just show you it just before you get, um, get um, scared of me using the word code. Um, so if a text, text one, and you can see it's well documented as well, um, which was what I really love about Justin, the templates. Okay, so this is what the code looks like. This is it. It's not that complex, right? So um, PHP, the field, and then that field was the detail that you put in before. So if it was, um, so in that context, you can then um, install the plugin um, PHP snippet. Um, then you can put that PHP in and then you can paste that PHP in any of your pages. That gets around having to use the code templates. And I actually do that in a few of my websites because where I want the client or the users to be able to use Divi, the Divi builder, um, and then still use the custom fields, I've set up the custom fields code in that plugin and then they can just add it really easily. So there are ways of getting around having to learn templating and you can still get the benefits of custom fields. Um, but if you really wanna go next level, then um, custom templates is the way to go. And I'm just gonna talk about another two additions to that software, uh, uh, to that experience of the library. And if I jump here, we've got related posts. We're using, um, we're using Jetpack related posts. Now, there's a few related post plugins and here's, here's a summary of them. The ones that work inside WordPress, hammer your server. It's a bit like scanning because they're gonna scan your whole website and they're gonna work out where your related posts are. They've been banned from most hosts. So you do not want to install a related post plugin that's doing the work on your server. There are a few um, plugins that do it on an external server they all cost a lot of money. They're quite expensive actually. And because the Commons Library, um, you know, they had a bit of money to make a fancy website, but they don't have, a, you know, a massive budget. So um, what we did is use Jetpack because the Jetpack one is free. And um, Jetpack also does that programming off your server. So make sure if you're using a related post plugin that it's not going to do it on your server and you can research and figure that out. Um, the other one is the easy, um, table of contents and this is this little plugin here and what that does is if you make every subheading a h2 um, which you'll be doing especially after doing my webinars on how to format copy correctly it automatically makes this so the team doesn't have to go in and type it all they've got to do is put that as a h2 code um, that is a h2 code and then it magically makes that whole thing which is really good for the user experience and it's um, obviously easier for the team to look. So that's a really nice little plugin that we use there. Uh, and also post types order. And what that will do, and I'll show you on this website, um, if I can find it. Um, so my webinars, if I click reorder, this allows me to reorder the posts because by default, WordPress will do it by date and just say that I want this one, I can just drag and drop the order of them, how they'll display, which is pretty cool little plugin. So that's another one you want to look at um, doing um, those sort of advanced libraries. So with the um, commons library, it's just too big to use this tool. It's not relevant, but what they can use it for is if they want um, to display um, what they asked me to do is on their homepage, they wanted to display, um, those ones on the home page in the right order. Um, they're librarians, they want things the way they want them. So we put in that, um, that, uh, that thing. So they can drag and drop the reorder of these ones here. Um, so they can do that. 
All right, so I'm at 358. I'm nearly there. So I'm just going to quickly jump over some mapping projects that I've done and just quickly show you the software that runs those. Um, and this is an, an older project, Australian Maps. I think this is from 2013, I think. And we've got a whole series of these. Um, we've got water and um, that sort of stuff. Um, so the idea here is that we um, can display our blog posts as a map. So if you look at these, they're blog posts. They're not actual, um, they are actual icons. So this plugin that we're using is by Chris Richards, which is um, WordPress uh, maps for WordPress. There's a free version and a paid version. Um, and so it allows us to put these custom icons. So if we tick on, click on one of these, this is a blog post. So if you think of this as a blog, this is a blog that you're seeing, it's just in a map format. And then if we click here, it will then um, show, show it on a map. Um, and we use the satellite view just to make it a bit more interesting. Um, then we can, yeah, there you go. Um, and then we, this is a blog post. So in a blog post, you can do anything we can want to do with WordPress, pictures and text and all that sort of stuff. Um, so then we made, we just use categories. Um, we could have done a custom taxonomy if we want. And then we can also, this is, uh, category listing that's displayed as a map. So in this case, it's all the actual um, uranium mines um, displayed as a map. And the way that this works is that you um, simply, the plugin has a um, Google Maps, so you just type in the address. So you might, um, and then it'll show it. Now in the case of uranium mining, uh, a lot of these places aren't on Google Maps, so then we have to get the longitude, latitude. We can stick the longitude, latitude in, and then it'll work as well. So um, there's a bit of complexity to this, um, uh, but I think that you can do 90% of what I've done here um, without any, like without um, advanced templating or advanced coding and stuff. Okay, so here we go, it's finally loaded. So this custom post type, you can see at the top here, we've got it in the URL. Um, and then here we go, we've got a custom taxonomy. It's just now gone, a custom taxonomy, which is recipes. And then we can then categorize that uh, recipes by vegetarian, vegan, that sort of stuff. Okay, so this store find is finally loaded. So this is using a different mapping technology that WP Fawcett. So I can, for example, type in Coburg. Now this software actually needs advanced custom fields to be able to put in the Google location um, in the back end. So uh, this, this builds a lot more complex than the one before. Um, however, so now this is all the places in Coburg to sell their product. It's got this great thing, a cluster map, which then can cluster the, the map pins and I can get, buy some from Tain Cancer Care and I can buy it from Pachamama and I can buy it from, I've got two offices there. Um, so this is using um, Fawcett WP and also, and so that cluster thing's really nice because there's 10 stores in Melbourne and we can use that mapping there. Um, so yeah, that's using um, Fawcett WP advanced custom fields. And um, one more comment here is, this this widget here is using um, this custom taxonomy widget, which will list all the terms in the widget. Okay, so hopefully that um, made sense.